We continue our coverage of Kashmir by speaking with Kashmir expert and anthropology professor at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in the United States, Professor Mohammed Junaid, who joins us via Skype. Professor Junaid, good evening and thank you so much for joining us on The Globe. My pleasure. Now, China says uh, India has uh, basically gone across and uh, done what it wasn't supposed to do. It undermined China's territorial sovereignty by revoking Article 370 unilaterally. How far would China go? Well, so historically, there are a number of international agreements and United Nations resolutions that lay out uh, that uh, any internal change that um, uh, you know India carries out or any other country carries out, which has a historical claim to uh, to the territory of Kashmir, will not resolve the final uh, conflict. Now, China has a part of the historic Kashmir, which is called Aksai Chin, under its control, and it further lays claim to a part of Kashmir which is called Ladakh. Now, what India has done by um, you know not only removing the Article 370, uh, but also turning the historic Kashmir state into two union territories is to lay complete control over Ladakh, which, um, according to the Chinese, is not an acceptable proposition. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Chinese foreign minister has said. Um, mm -hmm. So un India is trying to unilaterally change the geopolitics of the state, um, which, of course, is going to rile China, Pakistan, not to mention Kashmiris. Now, India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, speaks of ridding the area of um, terrorism. Is this area a nesting ground for terrorists? Not at all. I mean, of course, terrorism is, has become this stick to beat uh, all marginalized people around the world. Just because Kashmir happens to be a Muslim-majority region, uh, Prime Minister Modi is using this global fear of Muslims as a way to suppress Kashmiri voices. It's not. It, there has been a long-standing indigenous struggle for self-determination. It goes way back to, uh, to 1947. Um, and for the last 30 years, Kashmiris have been struggling for freedom, for independence, um, using all different kinds of meaning. And of course, uh, not all these means are acceptable. Um, but uh, it is primarily an indigenous struggle. Mm -hmm. It is not terrorism. There is no uh, you know, I mean, the, if you go to Kashmir and ask the common Kashmiris who is the terrorist in Kashmir, who terrorizes the civilians, and they will clearly tell you that it is the more than uh, half a million Indian troops who have occupied Kashmir. Now, with the action that India has taken and uh, looking at uh, the past, we, the UN Security Council, as you also mentioned, has, has passed resolutions with regards to Kashmir this action by India, is it undermining the UN? It is, because what uh, India has done by removing uh, a specific article uh, called 35A is to let, um, you know, allow Indians from mainland India to go and purchase land and settle down in Kashmir, which uh, what it would do is uh, lead to demographic change which has been a long-standing Hindu right-wing demand in India. Now, the UN resolution, uh, uh, Security Council Resolution 47, that was passed in 1948, clearly states that any final solution to the Kashmir question is to be resolved through a plebiscite, a free, fair referendum, where the people of Kashmir decide the final status of their homeland. Now, if there is a demographic change and Kashmiris uh, will be turned into a minority in their own homeland, we can only imagine, uh, you know, um, how this violates the uh, basic democratic principles upon which the UN Security Council resolutions were based. Now, what's the likelihood of the Muslim Kashmiri population going into a complete uprising? Very high. You know, already Kashmiris have been struggling using civil resistance, using uh, civil disobedience, and also, you know, uh, trying to find a negotiated settlement um, to this question for the last 70 years. And over the last 30 years, um, Kashmir has become a, a, a very traumatized place. Um, around 80,000 
people have been killed in Kashmir, most of them civilians at the hands of Indian soldiers. There are tens of thousands of people who have suffered uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or who are in jails and maimed. Uh, so, uh, and in all of these years, there was not a demographic threat. And now there is a major existential threat that Kashmiris are facing. So I only believe that it's going to take a very violent turn now. Let's speak about, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, late developments that we've seen, um, including a curfew and, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, soldiers' presence, police presence. How is this affecting the ordinary lives of Kashmiris? Well, you know that in Kashmir, uh, Kashmir is the most militarized region in the world. There are probably, there's an Indian armed soldier for every 10 Kashmiri civilians. And if you go to Kashmir, you can see that uh, there is practically no place, public place, where you don't see armed soldiers standing, uh, you know, threatening, yelling, or, you know, harassing common Kashmiris. Um, and now in a situation like this, what India has done is pumped in close to, uh, you know, uh, 50,000 more soldiers into urban areas, into the countryside. Um, it is, it's a crisis for the last seven days. Um, we haven't been able to speak to our families. There is a major festival, an annual festival going on, and uh, Kashmiris are the only probably uh, Muslims in the world who have not been able to celebrate this um, festival the way they used to. Um, so people cannot communicate out, uh, to the outside world. We have no clue what is happening outside some of the uh, few places that the journalists in Srinagar can reach. There's an entire South Kashmir region which is totally cut off so we have no clue apart from some of the indian state media journalists who go there and say that everything is hunky-dory everything is fine but we don't know what is happening there and uh, the supplies are running low i know that for a fact because i just spent a month there uh, that uh, people uh, were not expecting this to happen they thought that things were beginning to look normal and it is like a you know, you know, unleash chaos in the lives of people. Mm. Now, Professor Junaid, is this what India wants to see happen? You know, the action that uh, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has taken, uh, which is quite brazen. What are the, um, you know, Muslim neighbours saying um, about the action that has been taken by India? Well, first of all, in uh, within India, a majority opinion supports uh, Modi's actions. They are kind of celebrating Modi as some kind of a conqueror of a Muslim land. Um, so it's uh, very disheartening to see to, uh, for this to happen in 21st century, that we're speaking in this medievalist term of conquest and some uh, Hindu nationalists are talking about, like, you know, now taking Kashmiri women as wives and uh, settling down there and, you know, taking over Kashmiri property and whatnot. So this is very disheartening. Um, equally disheartening is actually a lack of sympathy from the Arab world, uh, who, which have ties with the Indian government and could have influenced, uh, you know, uh, Modi's decision. But uh, we have not seen anything proactive happen uh, beyond, uh, uh, you know, statements of sympathy coming from the Organization of Islamic Countries. Uh, Pakistan, which is our closest neighbor to the West, um, has uh, limited options, you know, unless Pakistan decides to go to a war, which is not going to end in some kind of a conventional skirmish, but a nuclear uh, war between the two countries. Uh, Pakistan has very limited leeway in here. You know, they don't have um, extensive trade ties with India. Uh, the diplomat, they have done what they could have done, probably, uh, you know, uh, ask the Indian envoy to leave Islamabad, uh, downgraded their diplomatic relations, also um, taken some of these questions internationally to friendly governments like China and elsewhere. But Kashmiris are practically lonely in this. You know, uh, they cannot uh, depend on the support of many of these Muslim countries either. Now, Pakistan has already started lobbying for action by the UN Security Council. What direction do you think the UN is likely to take going forward? The UN has kept Kashmir question uh, in cold storage for a while. You know, occasionally they talk about, they give random statements about uh, human rights violations in Kashmir. There have been several, you know, reports in recent times 
where uh, UN has uh, criticized Indian government on human rights violations. But they have not, you know, uh, raised the fundamental question of Kashmiri's right to self-determination uh, strongly enough. And uh, for the Indian government, it is some kind of a carte blanche that, you know, the Indian government believes that the international opinion is diverted to other, you know, pressing questions uh, globally, and uh, they can do whatever they want in Kashmir. A strong UN response, um, you know, calling for, uh, as Pakistan wants, um, you know, uh, having UN Security Council meet, uh, pass a resolution, uh, you know, send a message to India that uh, in 21st century, these blatant policies of annexation of uh, territories cannot happen. You cannot conquer land and people uh, like this. Now, this stalemate is a legacy of the United Kingdom. Now, where are they now? Has there been any reaction from them or is it just silence? Well, so, of course, you're uh, right, you know, uh, the entire Kashmir is a legacy of the way uh, in which, uh, the, you know, British left subcontinent, it created two states of India and Pakistan, but left, uh, you know, an, a small nation like uh, Kashmir in a mess because Kashmiris were forced to decide between India and Pakistan. Now, that question, of course, has not been resolved because Kashmiris, uh, fundamentally want to be separate from both these countries, I mean, especially from India. And they don't uh, want to make that decision. They want to be independent. It is the moral obligation of the British uh, to speak up. Um, I mean, there have been some noises coming from uh, some of the MPs. The, the leader of the opposition party, um, you know, has made some, uh, you know, uh, talked about on a tweet that India cannot fundamentally alter the status of Kashmir. Um, but these are uh, very symbolic gestures. That have, I mean, if they are really serious about it, uh, the British government should, uh, you know, uh, send a strong diplomatic message to India that you cannot, uh, you know, unilaterally and arbitrarily uh, change uh, historical facts and historical agreements. Now, looking at history and going back to February 1984, um, the deputy head of the Indian consulate in Birmingham was grabbed as he got off the bus. Now, he was heading home with a cake for his daughter's birthday. The next day, Kashmiri nationalists announced that they had kidnapped him and were demanding a ransom and the release of a Kashmiri leader in, the, in Indian custody. The Indian government, in response, refused and uh, Matre was brutally murdered. Now, the latest actions by India, could this spell disaster for the United Kingdom homeland security? Um, yes, I think uh, a rejoinder to uh, that uh, incident is that immediately after Matre was unfortunately uh, killed, Indian government uh, hanged a very popular uh, Kashmiri leader, Magbul Bhatt, in Tihar jail. His body still has not been, been returned to Kashmiris. He lie, his body lies in uh, Tihar jail. And in fact, uh, a part of Kashmiri genera young generation got radicalized because of the arbitrary way, again, India chose to, you know, execute Magbul um, Now, the, uh, now, you know, there is a huge Kashmiri diaspora in Britain, uh, close to one million uh, people from, you know, what they call Pakistanis are actually Kashmiris. These are people both from what is called Azad Jammu and Kashmir, which is under Pakistani control, and a number of a smaller group, but a number of people from the Indian occupied side as well. And they've been protesting, they've been demanding that their MPs hear them, that they, uh, you know, pressurize Indian government. And um, yes, I mean, I don't know, th this is a very peaceful community. Even in Kashmir, Kashmiris have been forced to take up uh, methods, unsavory methods sometimes, like killing of Matre, which nobody condones uh, in any case. Um, but it is primarily because of Indian actions that Kashmiris have been pushed to the wall where they sometimes see no option but to, you know, uh, you know go violent, which in the end ends up um, harming Kashmiris more than, uh, more than anybody else. Uh, but the Kashmiri diaspora in Britain is a very peaceful diaspora. They're very, they understand the democratic traditions. They want to protest uh, civilly, uh, but they want their MPs, their government to pay attention to uh, their brethren and their sisters who are suffering an onslaught back home. 
Now, Kashmir, we're looking at the current population at 7 million, almost all um, Muslims, and uh, Jammu, um, a current population at 5 million, which is two-thirds Hindu. Is this perhaps a formula or the best negotiation plan that Pakistan and India should embark on in resolving the stalemate by sharing, um, you know, according to its demographics? Well, you know, Kashmir has existed as a, as a state, as a place uh, that many people, many ethnicities call home uh, long before India and Pakistan were born. Uh, their aspirations of independence and self-rule have existed uh, longer than India has existed as a modern state. Um, yes, one would have uh, perhaps seen some kind of light at the end of the tunnel if uh, India had simply uh, said that we are going to uh, keep the Hindu parts of Jammu with us and leave the Muslim parts to decide for themselves what they want to do, whether they want to remain independent uh, and uh, or join Pakistan. because. It is true that in Jammu, uh, a large number of its Hindu population, not all, uh, would want to stay with India. But what India has done is open the floodgates for Indians to settle in Kashmir, you know, to alter the basic demography of uh, Kashmir, um, which to me has only a very bleak and a violent end. Um, it is going to be dis a disaster for Kashmiris, of course. Because they, what the Hindu right wing openly claims and wants to do is to reduce uh, Kashmiris into a minority in their own, own homeland and set up some kind of an apartheid system where the Indians uh, who will settle there will have uh, a military to protect them. They will prob you know, uh, probably be armed, uh, while the Kashmiris, mu Kashmiri Muslims will be a disempowered minority living in some kind of Bantustan type, uh, you know, regions. This is where the fears of ethnic cleansing seem to be coming forth um, with, uh, you know, the fear that uh, Hindus will flock to the region and push out all Muslims in the region. And it is a very well-founded fear, you know. I mean, um, I want to state here that in 1990, uh, a significant number of Kashmir Hindu are the residents of Kashmir, like um, you know, Kashmiri Muslims. Um, they left Kashmir fearing for their lives, and Kashmiri Muslims have been demanding and asking that they should return to their original homes. Um, but that is a separate matter. Uh, what here India wants to do is to settle Indians, not Kashmiris, in uh, in Kashmir. And there are already precedents, like in Jammu. Jammu was not a majority Hindu region in 1947. Jammu was a Muslim majority region. It was. Uh, you know, in, within a period of uh, a few months from uh, uh, August 1947 to uh, March 1948, um, close to 200,000 Muslims were ethnically cleansed, forced to leave their homes, uh, turning Jammu into a majority Hindu region. So India not only has the capacity to do it, uh, to ethnically, ethnically cleanse Kashmir, uh, uh, but also the military power. Uh, in the region. They have a huge infrastructure. They're spread out all over Kashmir that they could achieve this within a matter of, uh, you know, very short time.